Welcome everybody. Um, it's a great honor to be here and I hope I can show you some entertaining and interesting work in robotics. So I will talk about machine learning for robotics or you can also see it as bridging the gap between the world of data and the physical world. So if you come to my lab, these are some of the robotic platforms that you can see. So we have flying vehicles indoors. You see we want them to do coordinated motions. We also use machine learning to improve the performance of these systems over time. Especially in these kind of scenarios, you can imagine that it's hard to understand the exact behavior of the robot. And more recently, I have been leading an undergrad team that is competing in a self-driving competition co-sponsored by General Motors, among others. And we just came back from the competition and won the second year of the competition. And the first year. <laughs> And we also fly outdoors, larger vehicles. Here we test if we can fly without GPS, just based on vision. So these are some of the platforms we have been working with. And you see that robotics technology has advanced a lot over the last decade. But it's interesting to look back and kind of see it in the context of the history of disrupting technologies. I mean, all of you know, like, I mean, over 30 years ago, we had the first personal computers, which um, made a big difference. But then the internet um, allowed us to communicate with everyone in the world, and mobile devices kind of provided us this information at our fingertips anywhere where we are. Um, what is um, the, important to note is that this is all in the virtual world of data and information. The only way these systems interact with the real world is through us humans. So we can input information and we can receive information. Um, nevertheless, this technology has you know, completely disrupted how we live and work and has also created some of the most valuable companies. Um, robotics is, in my opinion, so one next step where we connect the world of data with the real physical world. And there are different words for this, robotics or Internet of Things, cyber-physical systems. But really the idea is that um, we not only interact, uh, we humans interact with the information, but there are actual robots or physical systems that use information and interact with the real world. The caveat is that Physically interacting machines is an expen exponential increase of complexity because our world around us is so complex. So how have roboticists dealt with this before? So in the past, you know, robot systems have been very successfully deployed in dedicated environments, for example, um, in, you know, in manufacturing or in warehouse management. But the, the big goal that we have in the future is that robots actually operate what I call the in human-centered environments. So environments that are not a priori built for the robot. And examples are self-driving cars or um, flying vehicles of any sort, delivery drones or personal um, aerial vehicles, as well as, you know, robots, for example, that help people to, um, to operate. And the challenge that we really have from a technical perspective is that in the past, for these very dedicated environments, as you see on the left, we could hand engineer the full hierarchy of the software system. So this includes everything between the sensor, like your, for example, for a camera, the pixels in your image, to the kind of volts that we send to the motor. And um, so we 
the roboticists have developed this nice uh, modular architecture that has a perception component interpreting the images and the sensors that the robot has and then based on that making decisions and eventually commanding the robot to do a certain task or motion. This was all manually programmed and based usually on a priori information or a priori testing of the robot. Um, the big challenge here is that this means that the performance of a robot is limited by our understanding of the system and in its environment. And you can imagine, for the examples on the right, it's really hard to a priori know everything a robot could encounter. For self-driving car, for example, all the different weather conditions it could encounter. Um, for robots that directly interact with the humans, all the different ways the human may interact with the robot. So that kind of is also amplified here, where um, this is a more recent 2016 video of Boston Dynamics. And this robot seems to do the task we'd like robots to do, um, kind of cleaning up our kitchen, for example. But the caveat here is this is all um, teleoperated. So the robot is physically able to do some of these tasks, but there's still a human necessary to teleoperate this robot because it's very hard to um, write all the software to recognize the different objects in the kitchen and then craft them correctly and so on. Have a plan of how to deal with the mess. Um, so we believe that in order to achieve better performance, um, enhance the capabilities of robots and also increase their safety, we need learned representations. So, looking at data and learning from data instead of just our a priori understanding of how a robot works. And for that, you know, machine learning is the tool, but it's really important to recognize that robots are very different to all the standard uh, machine learning problems that people have been looking at. And I just pictured one here. Um, um, in this example I, I have, you have an input in image and you want to um, automatically um, identify what you see in that image. Um, if it's a person or an airplane or a, a TV monitor in this case. And so um, uh, modern techniques like deep neural networks have been really good at image classification, telling you what you see in an image. Uh, modern techniques have also been good at very other, various other things like um, speech to text or um, language translation. But what all these problems have in common um, is that we have an input, here it is the image, and then we have a desired output, in this case it is, is there a person, yes or no, um, in this image. And we have lots of training data that kind of shows us correct examples of images and um, the correct answer that we want to see. Um, for robot systems, there is an interesting aspect that is not captured in the standard machine learning. We have feedback. So when the robot senses the environment, makes sense of the environment, and then acts, it can make an actual difference to the world, it can move, and then it senses again. But um, any decision the robot makes affects what it senses the next time around. And so this feedback loop is really interesting because the data that we get is quite different to standard machine learning where we have this kind of feed forward pipeline. Um, and the learning techniques that, that you may use are very different. So all the actions influence the perception in the next step, and it's very difficult to have a complete data set of all possible actions and everything that the robot could sense as a result of it. And so this is one of the main differences. So on the one hand, we have um, physical interaction feedback loops and these moving systems in the real world instead of the feed-forward pipe data pipelines. Um, there are other... Um, important differences between robot learning and general machine learning. One of it being we have strict safety requirements. You don't want a self-driving car get off the road just because it thinks it can further collect data and improve its performance. Um, 
usually robots are more resource constrained and getting data of robots is really expensive. I mean, it usually means me moving the robot in the real world. On the other hand, um, the data collection in our case is often that can directly be influenced because we operate the robot. The robot can kind of explore situations that may give it a lot of new information. This is usually different in general machine learning. You could just get a bunch of data, um, for example, a bunch of different images and their labels. And also we have some more understanding of our robot systems compared to um, standard machine learning algorithms. So it's hard to understand probably how to really un classify what, I what object you see in an image. But for a robot, we know there are some physical laws that it has to follow. And, um, and we may understand where the sensors are placed on the robot. And we could incorporate those, this information in the algorithms. So, what is state-of-the-art robot learning like? Um, people have shown, and we have also shown, that robots are able to learn new skills, and I hope I show you some more videos um, in a minute. But the results have largely been limited to learning a single task or learn, learning in a controlled environment. Um, for example, the image that you see on the right, you know, it's a robot in a very fixed lab setting with a very specific task. Um, all single subcomponents have been learned. Usually, we, it's optimized for expected performance. So, in, on average, improve the performance of a robot. On average, because the world is, you know, noisy and um, stochastic and um, it's if the robot does a certain task, it doesn't always mean that the, it gets the same result. And usually there is not safety baked into those machine learning systems right away. There's some external system that, for example, would stop the car if it notices it does an action that's too crazy. Um, what that has meant is that basically there are very few products out there, robot products, that actually have machine learning. And the reason is that, yes, for example, safety is really hard to guarantee for, for those systems. So what we need to um, enable um, enhanced robot capabilities in real applications is that we have data efficient online learning algorithms that have a guarantee of safety when placed in this kind of a feedback loop. And so in my team, um, we have been looking at this question and um, hoping to de develop solutions that enable us to design intelligence robots that can deal with complex environments and um, human-centered environments. And so a lot of my work and the work of my team has focused on learning the right actions. So not so much on the sensing side, but more on once I know um, where the robot is in the world, what are the right actions, so learning the right actions. And then we really work on a daily basis, as you saw in the video, on real robot systems to kind of stay true to the fact that, you know, for example, experiments are really hard to do. And the goal ultimately is to transfer this technology. So I kind of want to show you just a little bit, a lot of videos in terms of um, what can we do right now um, with robots, um, what do we do in my lab? And um, the trajectory kind of shows uh, at the bottom left what is easy for us. So whenever we have mathematical models that describe what's really happening with the robot in the real world, then we can use these models to design our algorithms. And um, that's the easier end of the part. And then we kind of um, can learn single tasks through repetitions, um, try to learn um, a more generic robot model that um, helps us to improve multiple of those tasks. And so, two of the things that we have been looking at recently is how can we guarantee safety while the robot learns in the real world and how can robots share information. And so I just want to give you some examples to kind of get you thinking. Um, a big focus 
in all of this is that we combine what we know beforehand with the data that the robot collects. And so let's look first at the one end of the spectrum. What, how does that uh, model-based design usually look like? So here's an example. We fly these vehicles, we coordinate their motion, they go from one configuration to another configuration, and in this simple example, we basically can assume we know everything. We know how these robots move in the environment, um, we know where they are quite accurately, and so we, can, we have models that describe the, perf the motion perfectly. And so if they now these 25 drones have to go from one configuration to another and they have to coordinate their motion to not collide, um, you can use standard algorithms. Still, you know, this is state-of-the-art research. This was a paper presented like three weeks ago at one of the top robotics conferences because computation still matters in robotics a lot. Like the faster you can compute, the better your ro robot performance. And in this particular case, we increase the um, decrease the computation time by 80%, which um, uh, um, allows us to scale to um, hundreds of drones and um, do this task um, faster and better. So that's the one spec end of the spectrum, and there's still a lot to do there. Um, but let's look at some examples where learning is really necessary to enable a robot to do a task. And one of them is um, flying in the open space at higher speeds. And I don't want to go into much detail, but the idea of this approach is similar to what humans do. If you want to do a, gain a certain skill, you practice. So you do it over and over again and you get better. And we do the same thing. And so what this looks like is we do it over and over again. We do look how well we do it. And that's this delta y. And then um, we change certain parameters. And that's what you do, for example, if you want to throw a ball into the basket or things like that. If you do it over and over again, you get really good at it. And so we do this for slalom racing with flying vehicles. And so if we don't, if we just use our prior knowledge about how this vehicle works, this doesn't work. There are so many aerodynamic um, effects um, happening that are very poorly understood. But over time we can learn it. So here we learn um, above the poles. And the vehicle observes how well it did. Would it go around the poles? And once it sees that it can do it, so we have this indoor GPS system as a feedback, um, then it actually can do it. And you see it flies quite aggressively, meaning um, it's at high angles. So if it's just a few iterations, it could actually learn this task. Now the question is, for every slalom configuration, every pole configuration, we had to relearn. Um, which, you know, is okay in some, for some applications because it's just a f four or five training and runs. But can we learn something that is applicable to many different tasks? And so we designed, a, in this case, a deep neural network um, that sits in the overall architecture. And, you know, we can use our mathematics to figure out what the inputs of this deep neural network should be, but the idea is we learn this block once and it works for any trajectory that you can, this flying vehicle can do. And so we tested this by getting people into the lab and drawing things on a tablet and then the flying vehicle should fly what the person has drawn. And so if you come to our lab, you can try this out, you can draw on the tablet. Um, if you use our standard model-based approach without data, you know, we don't perfectly follow, um, and it's quite hard to do that. Um, and then with the learning-enabled approach, we do much better. Usually, in the kind of error metric we look at, uh, about 40 to 50 percent better. And so we did a lot of testing and evaluations with people coming to the lab. Um, and we continue to study this question to even um, get better results. 
but people can draw different things and the learn the learning block that was learned once um, generally does you know by 50 percent better um, so these are interesting and promising results because especially the, the last one I showed you, you can apply it to any robot. Um, you just need input-output data from your robot and learning this block should improve the performance. Um, what I haven't addressed is for the slalom, we were flying above the poles first before going down because we didn't trust the system to not crash into the poles during the learning process. And for this um, hand drawing, we just flew in open spaces because that's um, generally safe. So um, a large focus of our work is how can we incorporate safety guarantees as the robot learns in the real world. So it moves really here through the room and um, you want it to make sure it doesn't crash into the chairs or um, you know, doesn't crash into any um, walking humans around. And so we looked at um, approaches that are based on reinforcement learning. Um, and we again kind of incorporate what we know beforehand with the knowledge um, we can gain from data as the robot operates in the world. And I don't go into the details too much how we do it. I rather explain a, a simple example. So if you have, and show a video related to that example. So if you have a driving robot and it knows where it is right now and it kind of predicts forward where it wants to drive over the next 10 seconds and Assuming that we don't fully understand how the robot behaves, there's some uncertainty where it ends up. So um, you can think of it, you are standing in a room, you walk without open, with your eyes closed, and you walk 10 steps, you don't necessarily know exactly where you end up, right? Um, and so this is the um, red or orange um, envelope. So it, if you don't know how the robot behaves, um, you know, we are not certain where it will end up in the future if it does a certain set of, a sequence of actions. So what this learning algorithm does then is in, in the particular example of driving, it would slow down the velocity so much that over the prediction horizon, let's say 10 seconds into the future, we will stay within the path bound, so we will stay on the road for sure, um, with very high probability. And then as we operate the robot in the real world, we get a better understanding of how it performs, and our uncertainty goes down, and then we can better predict where the robot will be based on a set of actions. And so after learning, what you see on the right is, um, we, the uncertainty is reduced and over the 10 seconds into the future, um, the uncertainty bound doesn't grow much and we can increase the speed and get in, in the fixed time of 10 seconds, we get further ahead along the path. And so I show you videos that may illustrate this. So here, we, this is the first run and it's kind of the setup um, course and you see the uncertainty is high but we guarantee that over the prediction horizon we stay within the path bounds and we can do the task but quite slowly. Now this is after three times you see the uncertainty is lower, we can try this faster while still not hitting any of these orange pylons. And so this was a setup experiment, but we tested these algorithms on four different platforms, including a planetary rover of the Canadian Space Agency and um, long-term experiments in off-road terrain around our building. And so here you see on the left um, an off-road road, um, the, the first trial, and then on the right when it um, has done it um, for the first third time. And... Um, you see that the speed is generally significantly faster, um, the uncertainty is lower because we gathered data. 
And we drove the robot um, because of that faster than we would have ever driven it before. And so for this particular segment, you know, the right robot has finished um, already um, because it can drive much faster. And so there are other ways to incorporate safety into learning. And one example I want to show you is very often we want to optimize the performance of a robot um, for, for a particular task. And a human actually tunes some of these design parameters manually. So you do the experiment, you see how well it works, and you manually tune, tune a certain parameters. Um, the example I want to show you is we automatically do that and we do it such that the robot is safe. And I wouldn't say that even an expert person tuning those parameters um, in a standard way would necessarily always guarantee that the robot is safe. Usually sometimes crashes can happen. And so here you see we want the robot to kind of go from A to B, very simple task as an example. And so we look at the performance of a particular set of um, parameters and then over time we um, choose the best next set of parameters to learn more about the performance and optimize the performance. And so this approach guarantees you that we only test parameters that are safe and eventually find the um, safe global maximum. And then you see we can fly much smoother. This is still a toy example for roboticists, but it's promising. Um, so the very last thing, I just want to hint towards it, yes, we can also um, use knowledge from one robot to improve the performance of another robot. So here, the important line to look at is the green line, because that's our proposed approach. And so over time, this particular robot on the left learns a certain task and gets better. Think of the slalom task, for example. So over multiple iterations, the um, tracking arrow goes down. And then we use the learned knowledge on a different robot, um, slightly different robot, but different mass properties and um, inertia values. And so in our approach where we have this underlying very fast adaptation, um, the new robot doesn't have to relearn. So the green line stays low, where with you know, standard approaches, basically the new robot has to relearn again. So there is hope that... Um, different robots, at least um, slightly different robots, can reuse um, data from each other and share data. So all of this, I mentioned, should go to eventually build robots that are better um, able to do real tasks and um, work on real applications. And so here are some of the partners and applications we work on. So they range from transportation, especially aerial transportation with partners like Drone Delivery Canada, um, to construction and manufacturing. So we work with MDA on um, mobile robot arms. Um, we work with mining companies and we work on monitoring with um, Ontario power generation. So there are different ways, um, different areas and robotics will ultimately, as computing has, disrupt any of these industries. Um, on the right you see some of the partners that are um, working with us on the self-driving challenge. Um, for you, kind of as an interesting way of thinking about robotics, um, Robots are hard whenever the environment is dynamic, meaning people and other agents being around. And robotics is hard if the tasks that we ask the robot to do are hard. And so you can kind of chart different robotics applications in this kind of um, coordinate frame. And um, if you do that, you know, for example, if you look at the top um, household assistant um, is still a little bit easy is up here, it's quite challenging, but the, the universal household robot is probably one of the most challenging things to build. But then other things like transportation logistics, when the environment is um, very predictable and the actions we want the robot to do are simple, 
you know, these are the things that can be automated the fastest. And so you can kind of map the different applications on that kind of chart and think about it. But the more we go to the top right corner, the more learning and adaptation we need, the more understanding and semantics we need on the perception side. And so coming back, how does this all fit in the Toronto environment? Um, I think you know Toronto and Canada is a great environment for robotics. Um, we have really strong university groups, and um, just a few to mention. I'm at the Institute for Aerospace Studies at the U University of Toronto. We also have a Center for Aerial Robotics Research and Education. Um, very exciting is that we are launching soon, in a couple of weeks, um, a U of T-wide robotics institute, which brings together all the roboticists. There's also a Canada-wide robotics network among all the researchers and um, a range of companies, um, I think over 15 companies. Um, and we have on the machine learning side the Vector Institute and um, you know, other top institutions um, that, that kind of can support this work. Um, and we also have you know, a range of robotics companies already in, in the area. And so I think um, it's really exciting to kind of take machine learning to the next level and connect it with physical systems in the real world. And so as a summary, robots are cool. They can do lots of things. <laughs> they can do, move actual objects in the real world. Machine learning can expand the capabilities of those robots. Robots have this closed-loop nature, um, which requires to rethink um, existing machine learning approaches. And uh, machine learning, and, and ultimately, that's the hope, enables new robot applications. Um, and you know, no, no self-driving car will drive without machine learning. Um, so let's have it happen, and let's have it happen here in Toronto. Thank you, Angela. Robots are cool. Unless you watch Westworld. Anyone watch Westworld? All right, any questions? Uh, so let's say you're at a, hello, uh, let's say you're at a cocktail party and an eccentric billionaire gets a little too drunk on wine and accuses you of enabling the robot uprising. As somebody who like works in uh, this cutting edge technology, I'm sure you get a lot of these like kind of edge case questions about that. Uh, what kind of futures do you see both positive and negatively for the impact of your work? And like how can we make sure that we as technologists empower us to go towards the positive futures? Okay, I'm, I tried to reframe because I'm not sure if I fully understood you um, like acoustically. Um, so you are asking what are the good and the bad things that can happen with robotic technology and how we make sure that the good things happen? Is that what you ask? Yeah. 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 Um, yes. So, you know, I, I think every technology can be used and misused. Uh, there's no exception. Um, and so for me personally, you know, I work on the projects that I personally believe in and I think are, you know, leading to the good results. Um, ultimately, on the global scale, you need a regulation um, to, you know, to make that happen. Um, I think a good example is um, if I point to self-driving, uh, self-driving cars will be very expensive. So um, there are two ways to think about this. And one way is only the very, very rich will have a self-driving car. And the other way that I think now most companies converge to is a ride-sharing model, um, which would eventually enable to provide transportation to people who may never have that um, ability to own a car and now they can actually go from A to B um, because they can pay for that single ride and because it's a self-driving car it you know may be affordable eventually. Um, so I think um, yeah so it's an, not an easy question but um, ultimately it's on the one hand the, the the developers and the people who actually do the work, that they decide to work on the projects that they feel are, you know, um, good projects. Um, and then I think alt we need regulation right, uh, for some of this. 
Any other questions? Oh, you're, you're really making it a good jog for me. Hi, uh, great talk. I have a question about safety and I'm wondering your opinion on the expectations we place on robots when it comes to safety because as we know, people crash cars and drop and break things all the time, which you know I'm not saying it's acceptable, but uh, we place this unacceptable expectation when it comes to safety in the real world when it comes to crashing cars and just failing in general. So do you think it's the right approach to have such a restrictive expectation when it comes to safety? I think we should try our best to design safe systems in any case. Um, uh, I don't want to be the developer that, yes, the technology may be a bit safer than the average human driver, let's say, right? Um, proving that is very hard, but um, even if you can prove it and we know this is just a little bit better than a human and then um, you know, you, you have fatalities. So that you, you, I think we should still try our best. What is interesting to uh, think about is how to validate this. Uh, I think there we will see a, a shift because I, I guess the, the big example is always the aerospace industry where and the way they kind of um, validate um, their systems and prove safety. And that is something that relies on knowing all the environment conditions ahead of time and then validating against all of them. And as I try to make the case in this talk, it's, this will be impossible. Right? So there need to be different ways to, to show that a system is safe. Um, and I think nobody really knows exactly how that um, can be done. Um, maybe a combination also of simulation and real-world tests, but um, it, it's one of the big open questions. Yeah. So maybe a non-moral question, just a, an easy one up front <laughs> here. <laughs> um, just curious, when in the in the drone examples, um, you know, like I think everyone here is probably imagining how it actually works, right? Centrally controlled. Is there vision? Are they talking to peers? Maybe just walk through like. What, what did we actually see there, right? Like, mm -hmm. is processing happening on the drones? Is there vision involved? Are they coordinating with their neighbor? Like, how did that actually work? Yeah. So, um, the indoor flight examples that you saw, there is an overhead camera system, a motion capture system that knows exactly what, where all the drones are in the space. And it's co communicated to a central computer, and then we can use that in a centralized way, or we can use it in a decentralized way, but the location information of all drones is available um, uh, in a central place. Um, and so for the coordinated flight, we use that. So there's a central computer coordinating the flight of all these vehicles. There are still, locally, the drone makes sure it um, executes what it's commanded to do, but um, there's a central planner for everything. Um, yeah. I think that for all flight experiments that I showed in this talk, that was the setup. Um, outdoors, the equivalent is GPS. There are other alternatives like ultra-wideband ultra localization that um, we look into. Um, or as, a as, a, as, a, as a, another solution is eventually vision. So you can envision to have something similar to what self-driving cars do, also for aerial vehicles outdoors to improve the um, localization. Question right here. I, I totally believe in uh, autonomous vehicle. I'm sure I will, in my lifetime I will be definitely, a lot of people will be using one. The fact that I, right now I am worried about stepping into the street without worry about cars hitting me because there's a human driver behind the scene and they are unpredictable. The fact that autonomous vehicle will be a lot more predictable how do we prevent human bullying robots say, I'm just going to walk across the street, I know you're going to stop for me. Right? I think this is an interesting thing that we should look into. What's your thought on that? Um, okay, um, let me try to 
So you are saying there are some implicit assumptions or a communication between humans that is hard to replicate? Or maybe I didn't understand the question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So the, the reason I don't step out to the street right now because I know that the driver behind the scene is unpredictable. But if most vehicles, a lot of vehicles are autonomous, they are predictable. As a human, can I bully the vehicle by stepping on the street, forcing the car to stop for me, even though I'm not at a uh, crosswalk? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are many things to get, you can do to fool these systems. Yeah. Um, they make they make implicit assumptions about the world, right? Um, otherwise, they couldn't work. So they also make assumptions about how roads are look like, um, how the road markings are, and so on. And if you change that in an unconventional way, this may confuse the system. Yeah. Hi, Angela. Uh, kind of following up on JML's question on the tech side, I was wondering, a lot of the kind of coordinated flight examples showed like four drones, or it looked like 20 or so. Can you talk a little bit about what the scale limits are today? Like, would we ever see thousands of drones? And also, what are the bottlenecks that are kind of forcing those, uh, those scaling limits to happen? Yeah, so I mean, some of the bottlenecks for us to do it, when, if we do it indoors, is um, space. <laughs> um, and outdoors, um, it's harder to get the um, flight certification to actually fly in Canada. We, we can fly a single vehicle anywhere in Ontario, but um, not multiple vehicles right now. Um, so one of the biggest bottlenecks of what you see, um, if someone has followed this, uh, you know, they're basically a swarm of vehicles right now. The main application um, in industry is using it for entertainment, for light displays. And there are some examples where, where companies flew up to 1,000. Um, they usually assign each vehicle a GPS path and assume the vehicle does a good job in following this. And yeah, in this thousand vehicle example, a couple of these vehicles f fell out of the sky. Um, so <laughs> reliability of the hardware is important, but um, also I think it's, it's not soft if one vehicle misperforms that all the other vehicles adapt uh, is, is hard to do. Like from an algorithmic point, if the number is higher, but also from a communication point, like yeah, um, there, there are commu communication bottlenecks and computation because you know time matters a lot in robotics. Like um, these these flying vehicles are really fast, you know, and we want to detect a misbehaving vehicle and react in milliseconds. Um, so there's definitely um, performance. Fa fascinating topic. Um, you're not the only shop that works on autonomous vehicles or, or robotics. There's many, many, many tens, maybe hundreds. Uh, what's the state of uh, collaboration to come up with a, a, a mode to uh, interact with others that are building autonomous systems? Is there any a move towards standardization and interoperability or anything like that? Are you talking about... Uh so let's say interoperability that code can be reused and shared by different or, codes. or are you talking about robots interacting with each other well both pretty much both like you no know, your your robots collaborating with other robots mm. your car co understanding the other autonomous car yeah so generally very little in reality it's sad but um there's a good i mean you know open source community and um toolboxes that are shared widely, and that works, I mean, reasonably well, but the interaction is, is a really tough task. Like in this coordinate frame that I showed you, it, like the, the more complex the task and com interaction adds complexity, so it's somewhere all the way up. Um, and the, the more you know about your interacting partner, um, you know, the better you can do it. If it communicates everything to you in a way that you understand, um, then the task 
gets much easier. If that's not the case, then it's much harder. Um, and interaction with humans, there is no direct way of communication between a human and a machine. And there are researchers, for example, in Berkeley, they try to estimate the intent of a human based on what a robot sees. That can be used for pedestrians, for self-driving cars, but also if there's a robot-human collaboration for manufacturing, they try to kind of infer the intent of a person and then act accordingly with the robot. But it's, it's a very active research field. Yeah. And very interesting, I think.